Well, it's, uh, you know, vets, military, family, and partners that welcome. This is our first Maryland Smith Veteran Transition Panel for the academic year of 2022 and 23, which is our way of accounting for sort of the years at a business school. Um, Tonight is on Pitching Your Future 2. We call it 2 because we actually did one of these a year and a half ago on Pitching Your Future. And it was popular enough that uh, our students asked for a reboot. So this is uh, Pitching our pitching Your Future 2. And what the session is about is how to sell where you're going ahead of where you've been. We think that that's important as a veteran in transition because the military really uh, gets you very good at selling your past, right? Very good at selling what you did in the military and how great you were in uniform, but the market prices you on your future and your potential in that future. And so we believe that a very important part of military transition and veteran uh, career development is about uh, maximizing what we call your vet present value according to that future potential. And tonight we've got three experts um, and practitioners in that field who are going to hopefully help us through discussions around cre creating a succinct but a compelling and entertaining and memorable and very important memorable uh, pitch and introductory narrative about your future. So first off a moment we always do this at the beginning of any um, uh, event that we have around our initiative for veteran lifelong leadership just to a moment of silence in consideration of those who can't be here because they're on deployment or they're out serving in the community in a capacity that keeps them from thinking about their career perhaps as much as they should thanks uh, second, some quick e-forum rules here for us. So mute your mic. Uh, if you can, please turn on your camera. It keeps us all feeling engaged as a community. Uh, we recognize that if you're doing something that may be distracting, you may need to turn it off for a moment, but especially if you're going to ask a question, go ahead and turn on your camera so we can see your face and get to know you a little bit better. Send questions in chat or raise your hand. Uh, wait to be called on by a host. So that'll be either myself or Scott. Uh, McGillivray, who is the Assistant uh, Director for Military and Veteran Affairs at Smith. Scott, you want to raise your hand? Give a shout out so we know who you are. Everyone. Thanks. All right. And then if you ask a question, just go ahead and let us know who you are. Uh, I know we've heard from you, Lisa, Teresa, and, and Quentin, so thank you for that, Bob. But let us know who you are so that we can uh, kind of get to know each other as we engage here as well. Uh, a welcome. I, I talked about this uh, as we were get preparing that we do these events for not just our Smith Vet community here at the University of Maryland, Smith, the Robert A. Smith School of Business, but also for our partners within the Initiative for Veteran Lifelong Leadership. And so those include Corporate Gray, the Mid Atlantic Veterans Business Outreach Center, Veterans in the Big Ten Veterans in Business Alliance, uh, Four Block, and Warrior K9 Connection. So if you're here from any of those partners uh, or you're watching the recorded event by, uh, through any of those partners, welcome and thanks for joining us. A um, little bit of context around this event. It is one of our platforms in the Initiative for Veteran Lifelong Leadership, which is our way of promoting veteran strategic assets for a united economy. Specifically, it falls within the mission uh, of enhancing vet present value. And uh, if you are interested in, in knowing more about the initiative or partnering with us on the initiative, uh, please feel free to reach out to me uh, after this event. Um, after the event, the event is being recorded. So if you are on the event, uh, keep that in mind. So control your language to the extent possible. It helps us to, it cuts down on the cost of censorship afterwards. Um, but then also um, it will be, it's recorded for, it's uh, shared for public access. So internal access, if you're a Smith vet, is through our Canvas site. Uh, external access, it will be posted to the Initiative for Veteran Lifelong Leadership webpage. Uh, future events will also be posted to that webpage, so feel free to, to, um, uh, to check us out if you'd like. Uh, and then we also have three LinkedIn groups that you are welcome to join to keep up with. So if you're Smith Vet, join us on our Maryland Smith Vets LinkedIn group. If you're in the Big Ten, uh, go ahead and join our, our Veterans and Business Alliance. And then we've got our, our public-facing initiative for veteran lifelong leadership. We also share all of our events and updates 
um, through that as well. And Quentin, I see you writing stuff down. I'll show these slides afterwards. So if you if you RSVP through our CVent site, thank you, and and you'll get these slides so you can so you can follow up with us again as well. Okay, our agenda tonight. We're going to go through some quick intros of our panel members. Then we'll go into some panel discourse, so some insights from each of them on the the topic area, and then we'll go into a live feedback session. During that session, we'll invite you to go ahead and introduce yourselves, and then we'll do what we call a Smith murder board or a murder board. Uh, our panelists will go ahead and give you feedback, always constructive. Uh, I can't, you know, sometimes uh, sometimes harsh, but in a good way, right? We always hope that they're helping you uh, in trying to, 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 um, to always improve, which is something that I think most veterans appreciate. Uh, so these are our panelists uh, tonight. We're really, we're honored. Uniquely, all of them are Smith MBA alumni, which is not always the case for these panelists. Um, but they're also experts or um, experienced in having uh, done exact, you know, in, in the topic at hand. So Ira Koretsky is, a, is an Army vet. He is the CEO of the Chief Storyteller, uh, whereby he uh, has clients and he does this for a living, um, helps them with narrative and, and their, their PR. Uh, Jacqueline Manger is a, uh, is a Navy daughter. Uh, she is Managing Director of the Ed Snyder Center for Enterprise and Markets, and she's also a Smith uh, Executive MBA alumni, actually a classmate of mine in that program. And then uh, Jake Stafford actually just graduated this last year from, uh, from Maryland Smith. He's an Air Force vet, um, is now an associate with Goldman Sachs, and we invited him for his perspective, because uh, obviously working at Goldman Sachs, he, he did it right. Um, moving through transition. So we're going to hear how he did that and uh, if he stumbled, what he wishes he had done better. Uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Scott uh, McGillivray. I'm also going to stop sharing my screen and Scott is going to moderate our panel. Yeah, great. Thanks, Frank. So yeah, before we get into sort of the, the live portion of our session, we wanted to give our panelists an opportunity to introduce themselves and explain how storytelling fits in into their lives. And so with that, we will go ahead and start with the chief storyteller himself, Mr. Ira Koretsky. Hua, thank you. Scott, can you see the slides? I can. Wonderful. So I'll just do a little quick chronology, uh, super highlights. So I spent a lot of time in San Antonio. So I know the Fort Block comes from Texas. So I, I spent a lot of time at Fort Sam. I was in the Army Medical Department, uh, Army Medical Service and anybody that's in medical has to serve there. Now I was an administrator. So even though I was an administrator, still did everything with the medical folks. So I was the chief information officer of Fort Ord, the hospital there and public affairs officer when I spent some time in my other assignments. A Little bit of fun fact, I did improv, like whose line is it anyway, professionally, uh, made about $8 an hour back then. So that's what I mean by professionally when I, I was considered a professional. And it was just a lot of fun. If you ever want to truly up your game, things like Toastmasters is great, but nothing beats speaking on your feet super fast. Uh, Frank mentioned I'm a Smith grad. So here's a picture of our after party from graduating. Some of my friends from when we graduated about 20 years ago. And then I'm also a professor at the business school where I teach public speaking, communications, data storytelling, and of course, storytelling. That's from a couple of years ago and I teach only in the fall. And it's a lot of fun to teach these folks, uh, these young folks, and, and watch them really grow and, and gain confidence. So as you're thinking about today, and certainly about your career, and wherever you are, and wherever you want to be, when you enter the room, and that's a proxy for wherever you're going to be related to job hunting, what do you want to be known for? What do people think about before you enter the room? And what do they think about while you're in the room? And what do they think about when you leave the room? And the best way to do that is, and I have a whole host of pillars, probably like 100, 120 different pillars across everything you do related to communication. And the most important is you have to be a problem solver. Otherwise, why should they hire you? You're helping them to do something for them so that they're gonna be better in the future. They're hiring you based on your potential to make a difference. So that's why I call it your better tomorrow. How are you gonna make their tomorrow better? And when it comes to the specifics, and the word stories is a generic term, your elevator speech is a story, your cover letter is a story, your resume is a story. Anything that has narrative is a story. 
So what goals do you have? What stories are you going to tell to back this up have to be aligned to their problems? And in a nice little graphic, I call this your system of credibility. This is everything passive and active that you do to help yourself grow professionally. In the middle and in the center is what I call your better tomorrow message, as I mentioned. That's that 10 word or less key statement, headline, hook, in specifics for the elevator speech, it's your first seven to 10 words that you say. And in the first circle, the inner circle where it starts with cover letter and resume right around the 12 o'clock mark, these are the ones that are most important to you. So if you're actively job searching, you're gonna have cover letter and resume and your LinkedIn and personal stories uh, recommendations. If you're sort of looking, then maybe you might have resume and cover letter uh, in the outer circle. It all depends and that's why I have question marks, it's up to you. So when you look at yourself and look at every opportunity someone has to discover something about you, is it communicating the message that you wanna be known for? Are there stories, elevator speeches, message all synchronized showing the genuine authentic person that you wanna be? And for tonight, since we're focusing on the pitch, here are the three steps. Promise the better tomorrow message on the top 10 words. The how details are what you normally say today. Usually the, and what happens is most people who deliver their elevator speech do facts. They say something like blank title. Uh, my name is blank. Here's my title. This is what I do. That would go in step two. And step three is your success story. If you're a recent grad or going to be a recent grad or a recent transition from the military, you're either going to convert the language that was military specific. So it's as a business. Remember, you're solving a business problem for them. So it's not about what you specifically, and this is, goes for anybody, whether you're a civilian or military, you got to solve a problem for them. And speaking about the better tomorrow message, which, this, this is what's going to differentiate you from hundreds, if not thousands of other people. If you were to do a LinkedIn search today for any subject area, like type in logistics, type in aerospace engineering, type in management leader, whatever, most people are going to have a title next to their face. So that little picture that you have, which is your picture from your profile, right next to it is what's called your professional headline. That's just going to be a title. CEO, uh, retiring army, transitioning air force, whatever it is. You wanna think of that as a, like a headline from a magazine. Magazines around the world have the same exact structure on their cover page. Headlines, headlines, headlines. This picture happens to be from a trip when I was doing training out in the country of, of Georgia in the capital of Tbilisi. And you wanna focus on that better tomorrow message because if you have a complex message, people are gonna forget you or make it up. A general job hunting engagement or, or opportunity you have starts with that resume and cover letter. Then you usually have that uh, introductory interview, maybe 20 minutes, and then they bring you in for a panel or multiple interviews. Even if you're on Zoom, you're gonna be meeting people. How many different people have to tell your story when you're off that call? How many different people have to interpret what you have to say? How many different people have to be your ambassador to say, oh, Frank was awesome. I loved him. We should really consider him. Let's offer, well, tell me more about him. And then somebody has to speak on Frank's behalf. So the more complex, the more forgettable or the more confusing you're going to make yourself to be. Here's a great example of a story. So Michelle, this is Michelle. This is her real name, not her real, not her real picture, but her real name. She's what uh, you would call a risk consultant in the risk field. I was doing a keynote to about 1,200 hospital healthcare risk managers, and my job was to talk to them about how to tell their story in the hospital. And the unfortunate job is they have a thing, uh, the unfortunate about is they have a finger waggle job. Michelle's of the world have to point out what the problems were when somebody has an issue at the hospital, usually something dire, a real problem after they have an experience or maybe even passed away. Michelle's of the world will get a file this thick I have to figure out, is it a people, process, or technology issue? And with healthcare, it's always people involved. So this petite five-foot woman could cause six-foot-plus male doctors to scurry like little tiny bugs when you turn the light on because of her finger waggle. So I always do these interviews before I speak, usually 10 to 15 people and always for 15 minutes. And at 14 minutes and 38 seconds, because I wrote it down and I'll never forget it, this is what Michelle said. I make a difference in patients' lives every day. Most of you say something equivalent to, I'm a risk consultant. My big push to you is 
solve the audience's problem, solve your job problem by something that's clever and memorable. This is your better tomorrow message. Perfect example, here's Joe. I helped him when he was at a workshop years ago. He's a finance professional. If you read Translate Strategy into Action, you're not gonna get that he's a CFO type right away. This particular professional headline uh, attracted the attention of what became his new CEO. He worked at that company for 11 years. Here's some examples. Just scan these over a couple of minutes. I'm happy to offer the PDF. And also, as Frank mentioned, this is gonna be a recorded and available on the various locations. So the way to go about this and to approach this is these answering these three questions. How do the targets improve around you? What problems are you solving? And some of the ways of thinking and standing apart from your competition. And there are some frameworks for you. I am a blank, I make a blank, I help. If you wanna soften it or you use a verb. Here's a nice framework and it breaks it down again with the descriptions that came a little bit earlier with the various three steps. You're talking 85 words. The average person speaks about 150 words a minute. So subtract that by two or divide by two and you're at 85 words per minute. Now you'll notice it says minimize jargon. It doesn't say eliminate jargon. I don't think that you should completely eliminate jargon, but do be careful about that. People always ask, what is my elevator pitch? So this is the printed version, meaning you'd find this on the website or you'd find it in a description of my biography. Uh, you'll find most of it, but not exactly all together on my LinkedIn profile, but it has all of these components when you read about me. And it always has improving performance and engagement because that's the center of your system of credibility. And the thing that I always want folks to remember and take away is, People will forget what you said. They'll never forget how you made them feel, especially in job hunting. Feel free to send me an email and I'm happy to send you a copy of the PDF. And those of you that are either in the service or transitioning, I am happy to spend 30 minutes with you for free, no charge as a thank you for your service. And back to you, Scott. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing, Ira. So, you know, Jacqueline, if we could transition to you next. Um, you know, with your background in acting and, and sort of being able to adapt to new roles, how do you ensure that, that your story is grounded in authenticity and purpose? So um, thanks for sharing a little, a little window about my background besides the, the Navy daughter. Um, I call myself a Navy brat. Maybe, maybe we're not allowed to say that anymore, but I'm a proud Navy brat. So yes, as Scott just said, <laughs> Um, while I work at a business school and I haven't been in academia my whole life, um, it's one of many stops in a very varied career. So transitioning is something um, I've become very expert at. I don't know that I did it intentionally at the beginning, but I will tell you that I think one of the tools in my toolkit that helped me with my transition was I intuitively was a storyteller. Um, I started working professionally when I was 14 or 15 as an actress when I was still in high school. My father was uh, stationed at um, uh, Treasure Island in Northern California, and we lived on Mare Island. It was a submarine base in the San Pablo Bay. And I got paid to sing and dance in musical theater and um, progressed to doing commercial work, a little bit of film, a little bit of television. Um, I wanted to be Julie Andrews and star on Broadway, it never happened, but I did make a living. I, I had an agent in New York, became a member of unions. I did make a living in that profession. And it's a hard profession. There's lots of no's. Um, I think you guys, as you make your transition, are going to experience no's. And what I learned was that no's were okay. You just had to let them go and move on and learn from them, right? Um, no's also make you better. I would probably tell you, coaching you at getting better at telling your story if you're really good at reflecting about why you got the no. And what I learned along the way as an actress, as I became more experienced and successful was I was talented. I had a lot to offer. I was solving problems for casting directors. I happened to walk in at 5'5", five, five, red hair, could you know kick so hard, high, sing so high. It, I wasn't fitting what they were looking for. It wasn't about my talent and my ability. And so I um, 
was acting for very many years, hit a dry spot, was living in New York City and started temp work. Um, by the way, I have a Bachelor of Science in, in Economics with a minor in Communication. Um, I did study professionally in New York after I had my bachelor's degree, but I talked my way into an amazing job at a hedge fund because the placement person at the temp agency was like, Jacqueline, come on, you're, you're an actress, you've been answering phones because you're smart and pretty and articulate. And I'm like, no, 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 I want this, this seems interesting. So I went there to sit out front, answer phones and you know be pretty and articulate. And then talked my way into a trading assistant job and then talked my way into a trading job, all based on this ability that I had to tell stories and to say, and, and really it's about enthusiasm, asking people questions. At that point, it was, I knew those people and I wanted to help them solve their problem. And so what I did is I told the people that I worked with, you see me doing this now, but let me let me take you to coffee. You didn't know I have a Bachelor of Science in Economics. So let me tell you about my, my life experience besides what you see because you think you know who I am, right? And it's in that dialogue, um, Ira talks about story. I think about it as a lot of back and forth and communication and listening. Um, one of the things that I tell people is I think the biggest lit, like, like linchpin in my success is my training in the, in, in the arts and mostly in acting because you learn to ask questions about motivation. And for me, it's the motivation of the person that you're talking to. You know, like, why are you guys all here? We heard from Saressa and, and Quinton a little bit about why you're here, right? I heard lifelong learners. Um, you're hoping to get a couple of tips. You know, you're working on your transition. So for me, it's whether you're acting a scene, which is what I started, negotiating with someone, right? Um, trying to find a new job, networking. Or for me, in one of the many um, roles I had in my life, so after getting into the hedge fund industry, I worked my way up. I was a CFO and a COO. Um, I eventually became a CEO of a fintech startup um, just through the great GoTurp uh, network, got introduced to some people in Sacramento. And I realized even creative, creating innovative products, it was this unabashed way I have and this curiosity to ask questions. And so I want to share a few screens. Ira is brilliant at what he does. I, I love his frameworks. I think if you guys get those slides and really work with them, you, you'll have a map for kind of putting together um, your, your pitch. I spent a lot of years in the startup world and pitch has sort of a different connotation. I teach entrepreneurship, by the way, in our MBA program and also teach the Lean Canvas uh, to undergrads um, at, at Smith. And one of the things that, um, that we talk about in the entrepreneurship world is never to build something that your customers don't want. And then there's something, um, uh, talking to customers is another thing people talk about in the startup world. And, and the reason you do that is you have to know what your customer wants. So if you guys are making transitions and you're looking at companies, Iris said it so well, you know, you're solving their problems. For me as an entrepreneur, I don't want to go out and solve a problem in the world if nobody wants to buy what I'm making, whether it's a service or, or a physical product, right? If people don't, if the problem doesn't resonate with enough people, I shouldn't waste my precious time building a startup based on that. And so to me, for you guys, I would encourage you to know the customers. And so who are they? They're all the buyers. They're like all those people I used to audition for. They're all those HR people that you got to, and, and later we will hear more from Jacob about getting through that, you know, gauntlet of people. But what do they want? And what problem, as Ira says so well, what problem can you help them solve? Because all are military. What's the mission of that organization, right? What problems are they trying to solve? And what I'd like to bring you back to as you ask those questions is then to take a little time and look at yourself and just be really reflective and say, how does that resonate with me? Do I also want to help solve that problem? 
does that mission res resonate with me? And if those two things are true, you're going to have a lot of interesting ways to add really authentic color to your story, right? You are who you are, but if you can make touch points to who you're talking to, know your audience, to me, it's about knowing what problems they're solving at that business. And so something we do at the Ed Snyder Center is we, we believe that um, and all enterprise starts at the individual. You guys are all enterprising individuals. And that whether you are a solo practitioner or you start a, you know, something where you, you work and make the biggest enterprise in the world, everything starts with people, with human beings, right? And we have aspirations. We have things we want to do. Many of you, because of the military, probably were called. You had aspirations to do something, if you think about it. And when I meet military people, it's different for lots of people. Some are very pragmatic. They did it because they know they can get the GI Bill at the other end, right? Like it's a real practical decision. Others, it's a very patriotic decision, right? What are your aspirations in life now that you're making that transition post-military? Sit down and just think about that. There's no right answer, but just know it. Just write it down and think about it. And then free form, write down what your abilities are. This is what I was talking about when you, you have this great military career and you did wonderful things. What abilities, what abilities did you use when you had successes in that career? And write them down, not in a military way, in a, in a way that civilians can consume. And if you are lucky enough, you're going to find a job that's, as this, this four by four quadrant says, is a vocation, which is abilities, what one is good at. You know, if you drive to the right, you're better and better at an ability. And if you drive up, an aspiration is something you really want to do, you know, to affect the world. When those intersect, you're just going to, it's a sweet spot. You're going to be happy in a job. If you're down in the lower quadrant, I would say avoid that. Obviously, you're going to have misery. Um, just, you know, aspiring to something but not being very good at it, we call that a hobby. We probably won't make, make, make very much money doing that. Um, and then, you know, yes, we all have to pay our bills. And sometimes we do just have jobs. But while you're stuck in that job, you can do the work with yourself to figure out how to move yourself up into that upper right, right quadrant. So, and I, I realize I'm not even on my pretty presenter view. You're seeing all my slides. Here we go. There. Now I'll go ahead. Um, the, the next thing is defining your old value, right? So this is, as, as Ira put it so well, what, what, how can you solve the problems of those buyers? So sit around and think about what are your, what are your features? What are, are the features of Quinton, right? What benefit or value do you offer to the marketplace, right? And the more unique those features are, the more indispensable you can be. So if you have skills, benefits that the marketplace wants, and you're really good at them, that's where you wind up in that quadrant of being indispensable, right? And that's about figuring out what, that's also a little bit about what you like to do and what you're willing to work harder to become better at. Part of your story should, should be about that because that, that's a great way to tell somebody how you're going to solve their problems, right? And if you can take real things you did in your past, translate them to civilian terms and define value for that human resources buyer, it's gold. And then, um, oh, did I go back to the voluntary relationship? Sorry. Um, we, uh, for me, I just want to, to, to have you guys, um, you know, really wind up defining success, um, and win-win traits, right? So this is another big thing at our center. And I want to talk about this because it's to, to me, and this is how I've thought of myself as an entrepreneur is you want to make the world a better place, right? And the, the world doesn't have to be the gigantic world. It could be your neighborhood. It could be your family. It could be your town or village or where you live. Don't intimidate yourself with the word world. But go out and try to make it better in this transition. But also do something for you and your family that makes you happy. 
Um, and the more that you choose a direction where you're benefiting yourself, that you're doing something for others, that is also important to you. That's about mission and vision and value proposition, but really mission. And then also benefit others. That's going to be a win-win trade. And I'm going to tell you, as you price yourself in the marketplace, if you can have conversations with people in HR, because this intimidates a lot of people coming out of the military where they had structure and you didn't negotiate your salary, right? You just put in for the next promotion. <laughs> Negotiating is hard. And it's probably hard to make the transition to say, I'm worth this six-figure salary, right? How do you quantify that? Um, if you get better and better at understanding your own value and your own happiness, trust me, it becomes a lot easier to ask for money. So that's me real quick. I've, like always, I've probably run too long, but hopefully you got some gems there, Quinn. <laughs> yeah, you know, you're, you're good, Jacqueline. Thanks uh, for sharing your insights. And, um, you know, it really serves as a great transition for our third panelist, Jacob Stafford, who, uh, really exemplifies a lot of the characteristics that, uh, you know, you just mentioned, Jacqueline, from enthusiasm, uh, uniqueness, and uh, really being able to have the, those back and forth conversations uh, to get to get where he wanted to go. So with that, Jacob, I'll pass it over to you to uh, share your story. Thanks, Scott. Hey, did you get my message today, by the way? I did. Yep. Okay, Thanks so much. Me, it's been kind of crazy, but I, I, I promise you, I'm, I, I'm, I'm always going to get back to you. Um, yeah, first of all, Frank, thanks for putting this on. Um, I got so much out of these um, whenever, I, whenever I attended and I was constantly taking notes and it, it was definitely a difference maker um, in the process for me. And Ira and Jacqueline, I took so many notes. I, uh, I'm probably getting more out of this than the, than the other people here, which is not the idea, but uh, yeah, you guys were great. Um, so yeah, a little bit about me. Um, yeah, I went into the military. I was going to do like four years, get out, and then use the GI Bill to, um, to get my bachelor's degree. And, um, you know, I didn't really know what I wanted to do, honestly, whenever I enlisted. And um, found a passion for finance, didn't know exactly what I was going to do or how I was going to get in. So I decided to use tuition assistance and just honestly hustled to, to get my bachelor's degree while I was in, use the GI Bill. Frank convinced me to come to uh, the University of Maryland for the MBA. And it was honestly like the best decision that I could have made for me and for my family. It was, it was life changing. So, um, you know, I think everything that's been said tonight, I can, I can definitely, you know, you know, resonate with that. I think for me, it was, um, you know, really trying to figure out how I'm going to add value, how I'm going to fit in and all this stuff, you know, not coming from a, from a finance background, feeling like, um, the things I did in the military wouldn't translate and everything. Um, if there's, if there's only one thing that, that you're going to take away from, from me tonight, just, just let it be this. It's that everyone has a story to tell. You just have to figure out like what your story is and, um, just be authentic and be true to that. And that's going to come through more than anything else in an interview or when you're talking to people, like if you can show a true passion for something and really be yourself in front of those people, um, they're going to feel that and they're going to want to tell that story to other people. Um, so for me, like that was, that was massive. Um. You know, going into the MBA program, again, I thought I, I, thought I was going to do finance, maybe consulting, didn't really know. And, and once I found out that, hey, I, I want to do private wealth, I did everything I could to like figure out, um, you know, figure out about, figure out things about the industry, but also figure out like um, what's going to make someone succeed in that industry. And also what do people want to hear? You know, Jacqueline mentioned um, earlier, like know your audience, right? Um, that that's huge. That is so big. I wasted so much time um, at the beginning of this pro at the beginning of, the, of my MBA, trying to figure out what story am I going to tell and and how is it going to resonate and all of this stuff. And I, I really really struggled with it to be honest with you. Um, so for me, it was it was finding stories from my past that 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 translate and that show the value that you can add. You know, no matter what you're doing in the military, um, you, you, you all have, have a story to tell and you all have value to add. You just have to figure out how to frame it. Um, and if you're talking to one person, um, you may be telling that story a little bit differently, right? And it's, it's perfectly fine. Like we call that, you know, being authentically adaptable. You're not gonna be, you know, the same person in front of everybody. I'm not saying you should, you know, change stories and stuff like that but you need you need to really understand who your audience is and what they want to hear because when I'm telling a story to one person and I'm telling the same story to another person that that story can look different you know depending on what I think that they want to hear um so for me like that was that was huge um you know some some great advice that I received um during during my whole process um 
when I was struggling with all of this was um, be interested and be interesting. Everybody's, like I said, everybody's got a story to tell and everybody's, everybody really is interesting. Um, even if you don't think so, I didn't think I was interesting. Um, and then I, I found a way to frame my story and I found a way to make it resonate. And um, I told it to everybody that I could. Uh, when, when people ask me about, about Goldman, you know, I, I don't have a traditional finance background. And for me, like going into those interviews and stuff, I had a little bit of, you know, lack of confidence and, and, and all of this other stuff. And I think I, I hit some roadblocks at the beginning because um, I was standing in my own way. Um, a lot of people self-select out of their dream job, out of the position that they really want to be in, or you know, they they have fears about being an entrepreneur or, or like whatever it may be. And a lot of that is is you just standing in your own way. Um, so getting those repetitions and telling that story to as many people as you possibly can, um, it 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 really helps. I think I talked to twelve or fifteen people at the firm. Um, that's just like informational interviews, like cold calling and emailing and outreach, um, to learn about them. Um, but also to get my story out there to as many people as I possibly could, because if it wasn't going to land with this person, hopefully it was going to land with the next one. Right. So that's, that, that was huge as well. Um, I'm kind of scattered. I'm all over the place and I don't have slides for you guys tonight. Um, but, uh, let's see. Can I, can, can I focus you please, real quick? Yeah, can please, I put you on the spot? Please. You're doing great. Please do. I want to ask you. So you were an air ops NCO, right? That's right. And you walk into Goldman Sachs, which is one of the top investment banking firms in the world, right? And statistically under hires veterans. What, what did you tell them? You know, I, I How did you introduce yourself. Uh, well, I, I didn't know. I, I, that's actually interesting um, that, that you're saying that. I, I, um, the more people that I talk to, um, they, as soon as they would find out I'm a vet, they would put me in touch with other vets. And so I actually found this massive veteran community within, well, within Goldman Sachs private wealth. I don't know about like the investment banking side of things, but within the private wealth side, there were actually um, a ton of vets. And so Frank, to, to answer your question, when I first started, I was like, oh, being a vet is going to be enough to set me apart. The reality of it is that's actually not true. Um, if, if you look at if you look at the office that I'm in, it's, I mean, maybe it's because I'm in the DC office. Maybe that's why there's a lot of, of, of military vets. Uh, there's only like maybe 12 or 13 advisors there. Um, four of us are military vets. Three of us are all sitting on the same team. Our region head is a military vet. So I quickly learned that just saying that like, hey, I was in the military, like that's not always going to be enough to, to set you apart. Um, so it, again, that's like one of those, those step, those setbacks that I had, that I had early on. So yeah, Frank, it was, it was trying to figure out like, it, honestly, it was asking a lot of questions. It was asking them like, hey, what's, what's made you like, why are you so good at this, right? And like figuring out the, 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 the special things that are, that are gonna make people good at this role. And then looking back at my experience in the military and saying, okay, look, this is all the stuff that I did. And it may sound great, but it's not translating at all. What do they wanna hear? And what types of things that I do in the military um, that kind of, you know, transition over? So like, um, Again, I didn't do anything with finance, uh, not even that great at math, if I'm going to be honest with you. But um, being in private wealth, like it's, it's about talking to people and it's about, you know, explaining um, complex ideas and, in, a, in a simplistic way that, that anyone and everyone can understand. Um, so I talked about that and I talked about a lot of the things that I did in the military, um, some of the liaison work that I did um, overseas and having to, you know, um, talk and, 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 and to jive with all these different types of people with all these different backgrounds. And, and like for them, that was huge. And it, it took a lot of it took a lot of, you know, legwork on my end, like figuring out, um, you know, what what makes someone good at this role. But if you can get a list of like, hey, this this is this is why people are good at this. And if you can look at yourself and, and, and look at your experiences and try to find ways to to make, you know, those attributes shine through. Um, I think, I think you're going to be, you're going to have an advantage over everyone else that's interviewing. So, um, yeah. And then lastly, like on the, on, on, on that front, um, Goldman gives like immediate feedback. Like you, uh, you uh, like, sometimes they give you feedback before you're even finished, like with what you're doing. Right. So for me, like some of the best feedback I got was, um, like showing, showing a passion and showing that I actually cared and that I actually wanted to be there. Um, 
I think, you know, whenever you're, you're interviewing or even just talking to people um, that, are, that are in a role similar to the one that you want to go into, um, showing that genuine interest, asking those, those, those smart questions and um, showing that, you know, you're, you're there for the right reasons um, and that you have a true passion for what you're going to be going into um, speaks volumes, right? Like they don't expect you to come into the role or come into the position knowing how to do everything. Um, as a matter of fact, during my internship, uh, we would have these open meetings all the time, right? Where they call all the, um, all the interns into the room. They start just firing questions at you. You're, you, they know we don't know the answer to the questions, right? Like they, they know that that's not the point. Um, so it went terrible. Like the very first one that we did, it was awful. And uh, we all get individual feedback immediately after. And so they pull me into the room and I'm like, oh, this is not going to go well. And they were like, looking through the notes and they were like, okay, Jacob, they were like, um, you didn't get a single question right that we asked you, but you had the most confidence in the room. So keep it up. Like that was it. It wasn't like you need to work on this, 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 and this. It was, it was, Hey, like you have no idea what you're doing, but neither does anyone else that's here. And, and, and that's okay. Like we're not, we're not paying you to like know how to do everything immediately or like off the bat. Right. Like we're, 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 paying you to come here to to be yourself to be passionate and 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 to and to have that shine through so um you you, you mentioned earlier frank you were asking about some some faults like some 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 specific faults um and uh you know for me again i think it just goes back to like the lack of confidence i was definitely holding myself back and and most importantly it was it was undervaluing um my experience in the military and undervaluing the skills that I built while I was in, because I didn't think that any of them would translate. Right. Like you're, I mean, and everyone here probably was, is doing, was doing, or, you know, currently if you're in the military or we're or doing very different things. Um, I'm telling you though, every single person here, you, you, you have value to add, you have a story to tell. You just have to figure out what that is and like how it's going to fit in. Don't, don't be like me and please don't, please don't undervalue your experience, undervalue, undervalue your, your, your skill sets. That was something that hit me almost way too late. Like, so just have confidence. You're in the right place. And um, every single one of you deserve to go out and get that dream job. Like I didn't think I was going to get this job um, on paper, wildly underqualified. Like when you're on their website, uh, you need to have five years experience. You need to have, this. I didn't have any of that. And I was open and upfront about it. And, and, and they told me, they were like, you know, you're going to have to work harder than everybody else. And I said, good. I said, I know. I said, that's, that's why I'm here. And they liked that. They liked that response. And yeah, so just, just go in, have confidence and just, just know that you're, you're meant to be in the room. You are. I think that's yeah. all I've got for you guys. Yeah. Thanks so much for sharing, Jacob. Um, you know, I've, I've kind of heard bits and pieces of your story, uh, both from yourself and from others. And it's always inspiring. Uh, here and that. So yeah, we really appreciate it. So now we're going to get into a uh, quick Q&A if anyone has any questions. Um, if not, we're going to quickly push into the sort of live feedback session uh, a portion. So uh, Ceresa and Quentin both reached out and volunteered. Um, I don't know if, if one of you wants to go first. Um, I know, Saressa, you did uh, email me first, so I would say the floor is yours unless, uh, you know, you, you would like Quentin to go to go instead. I can go ahead. Okay. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, hello, my name is Saressa Young. I am transitioning from the Air Force after 23 years in the military. I originally was um, aviation admin, uh, but the last six years of my career, I was able to get into uh, the IT world, with this, um, the service help desk. And with that um, experience, I decided to go into the cyber liaison career field um, once I transition out. I'm currently going after my A plus and network plus certifications and I already have my security plus. So once I hopefully get all my certifications, um, I'm trying to go into the forensic data analyst um, career. And the reason for that is my passion is for um, protecting people, businesses, um, whoever needs the assistance of people trying to either break into their, um, their systems or trying to steal their money electronically with the cryptos and stuff like that. So 
Um, I do have a degree in forensic accounting, so I kind of already have that forensic bug in me, but now I'm just switching it to IT. So uh, that's me in a nutshell. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Um, do any of our panelists uh, want want to provide feedback? Yeah, Jacqueline. You I was going to talk about the story part because that's his brilliance. But I'm going to say, I I was taking notes. I can't believe I had to wait as long as I did to hear that you have training in forensic accounting. So you talked about a lot of different things that you're training to do. But to me, you know, like this, you know, it takes a while to put stuff together. What is that nugget? And then in the middle, we heard, right, Ira, something juicy in there about wanting to Passion. help people. Yep. Yep. What was it? Passion for protecting people and businesses. Yeah. So I would want to hear that more, more early. I, maybe even before I learned that you were a transitioning veteran. Okay. Right. I have, I have a passion for, I have a passion for this. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm transitioning from a military career where I got to do, where I got to feel the impact of doing that through my military career. And I know with my background in forensic accounting and my recent certifications that I can do that in the civilian sector. Right. Okay. We're recording, right, Frank? Oh, no. Like, no. I mean, As Iris said, improv, yeah. that's part of my, I, I, I like doing this for people because it is my, how my acting brain, hear all your stuff and put it together. It's, it's a script. You're writing a script, Sarissa. Don't mm. be intimidated by it. Ira? Yeah. So to me, the, I protect people and businesses goes first. Oh. The majority of what you shared, I'm sorry, should go to the cutting floor. Okay. And re- focus it on the protecting people and businesses put the accounting forensic thingy that you mentioned i'm sorry i don't remember that in there because that separates and distinguishes you focus on the last six years only skip the rest because what it does is it causes mental competition when you say oh i did this for 15 years and i did this okay now i'm th starting to think what does that mean what does that mean i'm already behind I'm not listening and processing at the same speed you're communicating versus I protect people and businesses, period, uh, pause. Now, now you've got people going, excuse me, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. And they're going to listen. And so focus on what they want to hear. And then when you get into a longer form conversation, then they could say, okay, well, so tell me about your background. I see that you're in Air Force. Then they're really going to start to listen uh, but truly, and I'm not trying to sound mean, the other 15 years doesn't matter to them mm. as much as this, the last six years when you're this cyber forensic accounting whiz now. Okay. And what they care about the other part is what's transferable. Teamwork, independent, small team leader, big strategic player. Um, um, how fast can you diagnose forensic issues? whatever it is, right? That's where you have to dig in a little bit to your expertise area, but not too much. Mm -hmm. So what you want in the end, and I didn't have enough time. I mean, I could do this stuff for days. You want to have what's called a one, two, five, 10 model. And what it really is, is 10 seconds, 30 seconds, one minute, two minute, five minute, 10 minute. The 10 seconds is I protect people and businesses. That's your better than a That is wonderful. What's the 85 or 75 words that follows? That's your 30 second. What's the one minute? What's the two minute? What's the three minute? And the three minute and the five minute would be your career. I've spent 23 years in the Air Force, right? So you got to get them to say, oh, who's this person again? Then you suck them in with your awesome language and pull them back. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to find uh, that link for you and I'll post it in the chat in a second. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm taking notes again. You got you two are incredible. Like that that feedback was was wonderful. I, I have nothing to add really, except except what I will say is yeah, they're, they're 100 percent right. At the beginning, your story sounds like everybody else. If I'm being honest with you, and when you went into that passion piece, like my ears perked up. I was like, oh, what are you trying to tell me? Like what what do you care about? And honestly, everything after that, I was really paying attention. And before that, it just sounded like. But like yeah, they these two. Oh my gosh, I'm taking so many notes over here. And if I could just add, you know, one of the things that is unique about military transition is that you have to flip the scripts, the, the script. You are turning yourself upside down from what the Navy or military uh, uh, trained you to do. 
because your military biography is a chronology, but the market actually prices you backwards. So you got to flip it upside down. Excellent point. Yes. Thank you. And in the chat, I just put the article, the one, two, five, 10. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that, Ira. Uh, Frank, what, what are your thoughts on time? I know we're kind of uh, running short, Quentin. I feel, feel bad. Uh, yeah. I, I'd, I'd love to, to, to invite Quentin to, to do it. I can if stay. Anyone, I'm yeah, fine. Yeah. Anyone who's willing to stay, I'd love to invite that since we got started a little bit late. Yeah. Great. Yep. Quentin, if you want to go ahead and go. Thanks, thanks, guys, for this staying back and giving a little extra time. So I'm not as brave as Carissa. I actually have been writing mine out, so I'm, I'm going to do some reading more so than to come straight off the cuff. But here it is. Good evening, everyone. My name is Quentin Burrs. I'm a transition veteran after 27 devoted years of service into the United States Air Force. I'm about pressing through barriers and shattering glass ceilings. I love people, and my mission is to create diverse spaces that allow empowered leaders at every level to exceed their expectations while charting new, new journeys. I am, a I am a testament to leaders who've invested in human capital, who pour countless lessons learned, challenges and triumphs into me that push me beyond my self-regulating limits. We are far stronger together, one helping another than we can ever achieve alone. Allow me to join, partner with you to manifest greatness within your organization. I take the foreign and make it familiar. I make the unknown known. I build bridges to cohesion and strategy. Thank you for the opportunity to provide a glimpse of who I am and how I strive to make positive contributions in the spaces I'm blessed to, stay, to share. So Quentin, what are you selling? What problem are you solving? Um, my intent is to sell leadership and the ability to build um, autonomous leaders within an organization. So there's your better tomorrow message. I help build autonomous leaders. Right? That's your better tomorrow message. And then 30 second version. That was probably more like a minute, your version. So like I said, Sarissa, right? 10 second, 30, one, but always lead with your 30, unless you know you have a lot of, like in job interview, and you're sitting across from someone, you have more than 30 seconds. But at the grocery store or a networking event, or you go to a transition panel, you want to do fast because that's what they're going to remember. Um, and then in there, I'd love to hear, I, I don't remember how many years you said, something like 25, 26, 27, 27 years. 27. You have got to have some amazing successes in there. Drop a couple. Like I worked with an organization of 25 leaders and we improved this, 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 and this by 72%. And I have dozens of other examples throughout my 27 year career where I did those same kind of things of, of manifesting, manifesting greatness, empowering leaders, building diverse teams. And then you'd bring it back again to help build autonomous leaders for you, Marriott, for you, Microsoft or whoever it is. Okay. Thank you. You bet. Yeah. I was, I was going to ask you, and, and this gets to something Jacob talked about a little earlier is that, um, you know, th there are lots of frameworks and, and, um, tips and tricks you're getting, but th to me, there, there's a little gray area in all of this, that if we put these frameworks, even on an individual, that's something, and I would ask you, Ira, I totally agreed when we listened to Sarah, I was like, no, we, we just need the most recent because you're doing something that's very cutting edge and you're involved in, not only is your transition involved in, um, leaving the military, it sounds like your transition is involved in in reskilling and relearning and amplifying that experience with new um, with new knowledge and new certifications. Whereas with Quinton, I like that Quinton shared that he had 27 years. He didn't go back and say, uh, joined the military and you know, whatever, 2002 minus 27, right? But do you agree that like leading, even though that's kind of it's counterintuitive, I'm just pointing out that. When Quentin tells its story, his story, it seems okay that we're talking about a big chunk of time because to me, it really resonates with what the impact that Quentin wants, which is I'm a leader and a proven leader that can train other leaders, right? You said it so better, but do you agree, Ira, that, that those rules about time frames might be different depending on the person and the story? Absolutely. I recommend the framework and then you put whatever you want inside of it. 
I just want to jump in too with one thing, Quentin. So um, keep in mind that in the market, uh, that mission is always related to profit and loss, even for nonprofits, right? Not necessarily profit and loss, but it's always related to revenue in some form. Um, so the question I ask is, would ask myself, as I hear you say, you know, I was great recommendation to kind of focus on that. I build autonomous leaders, which is an awesome purpose statement. The next question I would ask if I'm hearing that is for me, are those leaders, are you building autonomous leaders for my market, right? Or for my needs, my organizational needs? And so now it, it could be that you're selling into multiple, into various markets, but I would also give a thought to, if somebody asks is that, are those leaders my leaders? How do you answer that? And you might wanna incorporate that into your pitch, right? So I, I build autonomous leaders for X, Y, or Z. That's a great point. And I, I think that uh, I'm in the struggling stage where, um, so I, uh, I, uh, I actually, when I first joined the military, way like 27 plus years ago, um, I was a, a still photographer, essentially just document different events on base. And then eventually, like in 2007, we merged under public affairs. And so um, I, I don't necessarily have the desire to do public affairs, but I do feel like I have the ability to communicate and bridge different, different, you know, people, skill sets, or whatever the case may be. And so trying to figure out a way, the best way to communicate that um, without leaning on the public affairs piece and then getting kind of pigeonholed or like boxed into this public affairs perspective. So public affairs is communication, right? It could be the marketing or it could be internal communications, but it's all about communications. And people are, especially today when you say diversity, right? It's very important now. DEI, right? Uh, really important with building the leaders. So if you're a bottom line leader, or a top line leader that goes to Frank as well. Are you helping sales? Doesn't sound like it, but you're helping efficiency. Now efficiency will eventually help sales, but you're you're making the leaders better so they can lead the organization better. So I would and figure maybe, out what those skills. Go ahead, Frank. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I agree. And I, you know, one as an example, just to jump in on that, maybe you're building autonomous leaders and communicators for distributed workforces. Right, right there, that's a transferable skill across many different industries, but it tells me exactly as a leader how you're going to help me manage my workforce and potentially either make or save money. And, it's, and for you, Quentin, especially, you need success stories, right? So, Reza, you're selling skills in yours, so yours is much more of an employee-focused Whereas Clinton, you're going to be a, a tool, a really powerful tool in someone's toolbox. So you need to come with some success stories already built. I mean, everybody should have them, but you especially need them if you're going to sell leaders, leaders on that, right? So you could be a, um, uh, a leadership and development person, yeah. training person. Um, there's another phrase, talent. I'm just forgetting that one. Another yeah, word that you use for talent. It's part of an HR department, right? Yeah. At least what, based on what you said, that's where you would fit. You could also fit as a subcontractor working for a government contract or someone like that that does leadership, de leadership development training. And for the government, since you know the government, um, you know, I, I think there's what, three military bases in San Antonio alone, right? Yeah, I mean, that's another opportunity is finding someone um, and you'd, you'd be sitting there, right there, there in your backyard versus having move someone into the Texas area, whatever it is. So you have options of being an employee or a, or a contractor, still an employee, but a contractor working for someone to help like the federal government or someone else. Leadership training is a very hot topic. Another thing down the road for you to potentially think about is becoming certified as a coach. Um, that would help you if you went down the road of being a contractor. Like me, I don't need that coaching certification because that's not what I sell. I'm a very specific skill-based coach for storytelling, but yours would be a much longer term. Like my typical engagements are six to eight months, maybe 12 if I'm doing a team. But by then they should have the skills they need from me, where you are constantly building the next generation of leaders. So so I, I actually have I've completed the certification for a coach and then also I completed Good. a 
a diversity and include diversity equality and inclusion certification as well so um i i, I think that the challenge is okay, where do you place it and i i think i would i would yes. heard you and i take away from it is um in that long term that so that three minute five minute is the opportunity to kind of start putting some of those things in but i do recognize the value of actually giving some type of an example up front to keep them um engaged in what i'm trying to communicate yes and this goes back to jacob's comment i can't remember the phrasing that he used something adaptability or whatever whatever he said was not was really nicely put but you should have at least two flavors of elevator speech one is the employee flavor and one is the i'm going to work for a service provider that's going to sell their services because if you love if like for example if you love to travel or you love to meet and i don't mean diversity in this sense but a lot of diverse different companies that um that's where those type of folks fit really well is you're constantly in front of a different organization a different group of people same skill sets different people like i give an example i'm working with a company that does flavors and aromas for food and beverage i mean how cool is that and another company i'm working for does cyber right two different worlds but you know they think their worlds are separate and distinct it's the same yes there's the uniqueness to it but it's all about communication yeah, and teams and all that. Yeah. One of the things, and I don't know if you've focused on any of this in your education yet, in your transition, um, that I would tell you to think about, especially since it's about leadership, and I've noticed this talking to a lot of military people, is um, the business world, you know, some, some companies are hierarchical and bureaucratic, but many of them are, are much flatter and, and well, bureaucratic in a different way, I guess, than, than, than government and military. But one of the things that I've, I've noticed and, and from my academic seat is that there is, um, in the younger generation, more openness to this idea, because back when I was a little, it, this wasn't the world, right? Leaders were people like my father, a captain in the Navy, or the president of the United States, and they were mostly white men. Um, you know, that I'm, I'm telling you my age. But the youngest gener the young generation is like everybody's leader. Like you're, the lowest ranking employee at Amazon can be a leader. And so this idea um, of, of your tra training and teaching leadership, just I would open your mind and heart to say, you can sell that kind of training. It isn't just in the old fashioned human capital of high potentials and the next mid-level managers or the leaders of the corporation. It's just teaching everybody to lead. Right. Well, yeah. Thanks again for sharing, Quentin. Um, we're going to open it up just really quick. If anyone else uh, wants to do their pitch, um, you know, we'll, we'll open it up. Otherwise, uh, we'll go ahead and, and, and close it down. Would anyone else? Yeah, Mildred, do you have your hand up? Do you want to give your pitch? Uh, yes, I would like to give my pitch. Um, okay. Hi, my name is Mildred. I help people through the healing process and also help them reduce stress. I'm currently a registered nurse and an army vet, and I'm obtaining my MBA to run a wellness company that help people create balance in the various aspect of their lives. Thank you. So I you want to, you want, that was the 10 second or the 15 second. Yeah, that was a short one. Go ahead, Jacqueline. Sorry. That we got, that we got one of the, you go. Okay. Um, so Mildred, are you looking to use your MBA to start your own business? Okay. Don't oh. forget, turn your, yeah, turn your yeah. mic on. Yeah. Okay. So something like, I, I don't remember what you said, but you had some really nice messages in there. Something like you create better, better lives. I can't remember exactly what you said. No, I said I help people through uh, the healing process and to reduce stress. No, no, no. Then you said after you you said after the MBA, what did you say there? Oh, um, I'm creating my wellness company to help people create uh, have balance in the very aspect of their lives. Okay, so balance is what you. Okay, so focus on the message of your. Wait, well, hold on a second. Do you want to stay employed or do you want to start your business? What's this elevator pitch for? To start my business. Yeah, you okay. sound like an entrepreneur, Mildred. So, <laughs> so focus on the message after your MBA about, now, 
Um, I'll be very blunt. I don't think balance is what is going to sell for you. So something like, this is what I process as balances. I help people create better lives Mm -hmm. and then use balance as the mechanism, the how through programs of wellness and balance or, or through programs of wellness, we help you balance whatever it is. And then that becomes the mechanism of how. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Good. And then also I would have some success stories for you as well. Always have. Please. Go ahead. You were going to say something? No, I just said, okay. Oh, okay. Good. I, I I was sold, Mildred. I liked it. I loved it, actually. Um, I loved it for you individually. I, I got to know you very quickly, right? Um, and I think what one of the things that Ira is kind of uh, zeroing in on um, is that it depends. Are you selling your business and your potential to start the business, right? Or are you selling yourself as a as an as as a human interest story, right? And that depends. There there can be different purposes. It's kind of what I think Ira mentioned that you know, what's the room you're walking into, right? What do you want to take away from it? Um, I think you were mixed. That was my impression that that your pitch was a bit mixed. But if you're, if you're selling your business and your business is your passion, then put it right up front, just deliver that because that tells me right away where you are in the market and what value you're going to deliver through the market. Okay. Just a, just a thought from my, from my seat, but thank you. And that's a strong approach, Frank, whether she's talking to somebody that she wants money from uh then the the number two person to kind of entice them to come join with you as you build the thing right all of the those different audiences would respond to that um kind of a message or a pitch thank you okay great um well just to wrap things up Uh, We just wanted to say, you know, thank you to our panelists, Jacob, uh, Ira, and and Jacqueline for being here and for staying on a few minutes uh, afterwards. I know, I think I mentioned it to the two of you, but um, I I told Frank this about a year ago. This is, in my opinion, the the best panel um, that that we've done. And I think uh, tonight was, was, was no exception. So really appreciate you all being here. Um, Thank you for for those that, uh, for that, that, that shared. And um, I think that's all I have, Frank. Am I missing anything? Yeah, just uh, if you registered for tonight through the CVENT site, then thank you. And you will receive uh, the link for the video once we post it. It takes a few days for us to caption it and get it onto the site. But you'll receive that link and you will also receive the slides from tonight's uh, presentation as well so that you can you can reference those. So thank you all for joining. Please keep up with us. Join us again. If you're in four blocks, spread the news. If you got value out of tonight, we'd love to have more four blockers uh, joining us as well as uh, other veterans that you might affiliate with in your communities. Um, And uh, good luck in the rest of your transition. We're rooting for you.